Okay, so hello everybody. Um, on this wonderful Monday, April 25, 2022, it's 1400 here in Tallinn, Estonia, and uh, 6 a.m. in Chicago. So thank you very much for being here. Um, our guests today are Julio M. Otinio and Bruce Mao, who are um, the authors of a book called The Nexus. Um, and so this is uh, appearing on MIT Press, coming out in two weeks, if I'm rightly informed, uh, and is about the new convergence of art, technology, and science. And I could easily fill the next two hours with the achievements of uh, Julio Moutinho and uh, Bruce Mao, which I'm not going to do, so I only give you a little intro. So Julio Moutinho is uh, the... Um, co-director of Northwestern University's Institute of Complex Systems. He is the Dean of Engineering there. Um, he's also the author of one of the most um, uh, revered textbooks in uh, fluid dynamics on chaotic mixing. He's also a painter, and now he's mixing people. And so there is... Um, a compliment here, which is uh, Bruce Mao, who is a designer, which everybody who has anything to do with architecture in the last uh, 25 years or 30 years uh, knows, because he was the designer of Ren Kohlhausen's book, SML XL, which was definitely the heaviest book I own until Steve Wolfram came along. Um, and there's a bunch of other books that are equally uh, sized by now. And he did books with Stone Books, Getty Research Institute, and Gagosian Gallery. And so today, it's our greatest pleasure to have you here, not only because um, we think that um, what you do in this book is heavily uh, relevant for um, what we do, which is cultural data analytics, mixing a spectrum of disciplines, but also because I think this is inspiring for a very great uh, um, share of people who are struggling with the fact they're stuck in a discipline, they want to collaborate beyond disciplines, uh, between art and science, bringing technology and culture together, and so on. And uh, you have been a thought leader in this area, and not only a thought leader, but you made an institution at Northwestern University where this works across departments in a really exemplary way for those of you who have traveled university campuses and have seen what's going on there, uh, you would be fascinated about like how people automatically encounter each other in the hallway, even though they study different disciplines and so on. So without further ado, I will just give over the stage to Julio and Motinio and Bruce now. And um, let's see what you have in stock for us. Um, it's a mesmerizing book very lavishly um, um, illustrated. So we expect nothing less than a firework. Thank you, Maximilian. So I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I presume many of you are probably happy with Macron winning in France. So I'm pretty happy about that. Me too. And I, I mentioned this because there are so many bad things going on in the world. The, the book that Bruce and I have done is essentially an optimistic book. Uh, and it has to do with that, if you look at the greatest achievements of um, humanity, <laughs> there are three buckets where all creativity has been deposited through history and is art, technology, and science. Now, we wanted to do this book. We have been talking about this material for a, maybe close to 12, 15 years with Bruce. And there are lots of reasons why you want to do something like this now. The world is getting really complicated. I'm not going to go through all of these, but technology is permeating all areas of society. The concept of work is being redefined. So there are lots of things with boundaries blurring, the knowledge being fragmented, um, tons of things 
that are capturing our attention. Connectivity everywhere, and this has lots of benefits and lots of risks. Everything that is in the way of waves of innovation is becoming shorter, they are piling up with each other. Wealth in, you can argue, has never been greater, but the divides between richest and poorest are becoming wider and wider. Environment. Um, yeah, success in increasing longevity has resulted in the biggest demographic explosion in history. We are facing an amazing energy transition, connectivity changing all the rules. And in fact, if you just look at Connectivity, you can have these three things in here. The, we see the pluses and minuses of connectivity. So the book will focus on two things, really. One is how can we augment our thinking spaces? And the second theme is how can we operate in this complex world of ours? So the manifesto of the book is here. And Bruce, if you want to say a few words now, that would be great. Sure. Um, I mean, I, th I think it, you know, if the, the conditions that Julio set out um, are really a kind of new set of conditions, a new you know, when you take them all together simultaneously, which is really what we have now, um, it creates a new kind of challenge. Um, and that means that we new, need a new way of thinking. We need a new kind of thinking space. Um, you know, we have to be able to get beyond the classical boundaries and the kind of classical uh, disciplines of our practice. We need uh, new levels of, of creativity um, and new levels of execution. Um, so the, really the, the project that we took on was, you know, how do we bring these worlds together, the worlds that had really evolved as separate cultures, uh, as really almost like discrete languages, uh, and had for, you know, almost a century really been, been kind of pulling apart uh, into their, into their uh, separate languages and worlds, um, how can we bring them back together uh, so that we can really confront the, the greatest challenges in human history? So this is a big task and obviously it would be impossible to develop all ideas to the level of precision that all the people who operate in different components would demand. But at the end of the day, the book is about uh, two things. Uh, is leadership and innovation, okay? At the end of the day, this is what we're trying to affect. And when we talk about leadership and innovation, we are talking about both individuals and teams. But the themes of the book, as I, we said, is the augmentation of the thinking spaces and then the idea of complexity. Now, the next few slides, they will be known to all of you, but depending on who we are giving the talk, we have to explain this in more detail. Uh, the evolution of a technology is this classical thing. It's a birth, rapid growth, maturation. And you can pick example after example of the evolution of technologies. For example, if we talk about recording um, history, you can start from vellum, papyrus, paper, to everything be stored electronically. And when I show you all of these, plus these things don't operate in a vacuum, um, they, there is a system of, of rules governing the distribution of information. When you look at all of these for any technology that you can think of, uh, I'm old enough that I remember the transition of the IBM electric typewriters in which at some point it became so amazing. You could change the font by changing this little ball. Yeah, that, that was revolutionary, okay? But if, the, if I show you technologies, any technology, and I display them 
in front of you, you will be able to tell me in which direction the arrow of time goes. And sometimes you see transitions, like for example, these Harley Davidsons, the Museum of Harley Davidson is a little bit north of here. 1912, you have a Harley Davidson with one cylinder and a leather belt. And in one year, you went to two cylinders and the chain belt. Actually, this looks pretty much like the normal Harley Davidsons of today. But nothing of the knowledge that Harley Davidson accumulated making machines that make the right sound because the, the two cylinders are at the right angle in between them will help you when you transition to e-bikes, okay? So these couple of slides serve to illustrate what are thinking modes. And the book uses as a backdrop heavily modern and contemporary art. Why visual art? The reason for visual art is that the trail survives. Remember when I said, if you put the technologies and you display them, you will be able to guess in which direction the arrow of time goes. In visual arts, even though it's supposed to be the most creative of all disciplines, according to popular conception, Guernica did not appear out of thin air. There were lots of sketches that gave eventually birth to the what is at the lower right, which is the final Guernica in the Reina Sofia. There were about 43 sketches of Guernica before Guernica became Guernica. And if I show you this series of paintings between 1910, 1988, Unless you really are on top of modern and contemporary art, and I ask you to put them in the right chronological order, it will be hard for most people to do it. In fact, there are two paintings in there that are by, done by the same person, and it, even that will be a hard question to answer. By the way, the oldest is this Kandinsky. The two paintings that are the same are Kera Richter, these two here. And if you put more technology, here you have oil and acrylics, basically. It would be hard. Yeah, pigments were invented at different times and uh, people when do authentications, they can look at the kind of pigments, but there is not much technology here. There is more technology here. Every architect and designer has had the compulsion of designing a chair. Do we need a new chair? No, there are chairs that work. The only catch in designing a chair, it cannot look like any other previous chair. If I ask you to put all of these in chronological order, it will be tough as well. So what we have is evolution of ideas, technologies. Uh, they are more or less like this. Uh, we don't wait for one technology to run its course before the new one appears. And eventually you can have both successions within a class of technologies with followed by some or some periodic kind of revolutions in there. And eventually you reach this picture, which is more or less how science evolves. Science is much more organized, methodical than technology. There are no dead branches in science. It's an idea, it's not working, it gets discarded. But when you put all waves of technology together, piling up like this, this is how art operates, especially now in modern and contemporary art. So you have this situation in the evolution of art in which there are no recognizable periods, uh, I would say post-1930. All of these movements kind of pile up into each other and they all coexist. So the picture that is probably the most important of this part is the fingerprint of evolution of art, technology, and science. Science builds on the past. They are in frequent disruptions. Quantum mechanics will be one. Technology is continual adaptation with disruptions. And art is constant reinvention. So in science, the standing on the shoulders of giants is a good idea. In fact, science forever, well, not forever, actually, modern science, post 
the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society, let's say, is open source. You document what you are basing your ideas on. So standing on the shoulders of giants is a good idea in science. In technology, the only reason to stand on the shoulders of an elder giant is to crush the elder giant. You want to display that technology. And in art, it's a bad idea to stand next to anybody. The worst thing that you can say in art is that something is derivative. Derivative is not a bad word in technology. Adaptations and remixes are good, but in art, much less so. So you have this Two, this is clearly a metaphor, the brain is more complicated than this, but you have these extreme modes of thinking, and then you have combinations of these in art, technology, and science. On one hand, you have what you would call the rational left brain, logic, analytical, convergent, uh, decomposing problems, uh, as opposed to holistic, the right side, uh, metaphors, uh, more putting parts together in the whole. So basically these are two different ways of seeing the world. And this is what we call the whole brain metaphor, okay? Now, so we have these three domains, art, technology, and science. And there are a few things that you can argue link those domains. And this is one sketch that we can use to represent this. Bruce. So if you think about the everyday practice, um, you know, in, in our world that really operates as a nexus practice that really brings these worlds together, uh, design is one, of the, is one of the practices that really works across the disciplines. Um, you know, as a working designer, everything I do has to be scientifically sound. Um, everything I do is a technology of one sort or another. Even a book is a technology, although it you know, may be several hundred years old, it's still uh, a technology. Um, and, but, but the things I do really only work if they touch people, if I uh, make them you know, emotionally effective, if I can reach across uh, emotionally to someone and, and uh, touch them. So the practice in our world that really operates as a nexus practice uh, is a design practice. And you could see, you could imagine that um, there are kind of different practices within that laws and shape of, of design that there are, you know, over to the left-hand side, um, more engineering practices that are science and technology. And, um, and over to the right-hand side, um, you know, more, more so-called creative practices uh, that are art and technology. Uh, but in, in, in some ways, you know, its essence is really uh, reaching across that left brain, right brain uh, 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 practice and, you know, combining analytics and aesthetics, uh, the rational and the divergent, the quantitative uh, and the metaphorical. So that's really what the design practice uh, looks like. So it's a really good, uh, you know, if you're thinking about the nexus, it's a great place to start. One of the kind of um, sources for, for us for really starting this investigation was this extraordinary journal that happened in 1950 by, uh, edited, edited by a man named Harry Holtzman. Um, and Holtzman, uh, you know, basically the, the kind of opening page of the first uh, edition, they only produced three, three editions um, in uh, 1950, 51 and 52. Um, in the opening page said, uh, you know, these three worlds, uh, our technology and science have been torn asunder and uh, they have developed specialized language um, and are too often treated as cultural isolates. Uh, and, uh, and the most important questions of our time require that we bring them back together uh, and so that really was the effort uh, of, this, of this publication. And you can see that from the contributors, uh, I mean, it's an absolutely extraordinary list of contributors that includes um, Alfred Barr, who was the uh, founding director of the Museum of Modern Art, uh, Buckminster Fuller, Ad Reinhardt, uh, Luc Carbusier, Piet Mondrian, 
uh, S.I. Hayakawa, Oscar Wilde. I mean, really um, a wonderful um, combination. Um, and that, that happened in each issue. Um, just as a kind of um, really fascinating note, the bottom image on the right-hand side uh, is the centerfold, which was done in each issue by Ad Reinhardt. And each issue was a kind of extraordinary cartoon diagram, unlike anything else I've ever seen by Ed Reinhardt, uh, of the world. It was a way of kind of showing one aspect of the world. In this case, it was the museum world. It was the museum landscape where um, each tree was an art movement. Uh, each branch was a, uh, was a sub movement and each leaf on the tree was an artist. Um, I mean, really extraordinary uh, kind of, again, kind of holistic look. Um, another landmark in the kind of culture of Nexus uh, is the work of Georgi Kepesh at MIT. Um, he did this amazing set of books um, called the Vision and Values series. Um, and really one of the best, I mean, if you really want one single project uh, comprehensively on design culture, uh, this is maybe the best ever. Um, and it really, again, is, a, is, you know, is that kind of nexus uh, culture brought to life. So when we uh, came to designing the book of the nexus, uh, we wanted to, to kind of really uh, you know, design it and produce it in the spirit of nexus. Um, and so you can see this is the, this is the kind of plan for the book. Um, it opens, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, it opens with a, um, a, a cinematic opening credits. It has almost like a, the start of a movie where you see what is going on in the world in this kind of nexus world. Uh, we then have a, a contents section where we map out the entire book. So it's, it's a very unusual, unorthodox contents uh, section that really it, almost like a, a, a kind of um, 19th century book uh, wherein the reader uh, is introduced to ideas in each chapter. Uh, we really kind of get a sense. Uh, and then each chapter has a kind of similar structure so that the reader uh, can kind of follow the, the diagram of what we're, uh, of what we're introducing. Uh, and it's a very complex synthesis in the spirit of Nexus of visual and textual information uh, that really crosses all the disciplines. Uh, so I'll take you through a few of the, those chapter openings just to give you a sense. Uh, chapter two, the evolving domains of art, technology, and science, the understanding how the domains work. Um, and we open with uh, an image of, of, the, of the NASA uh, space program. Chapter three is creativity at the Nexus. Uh, and this is a project uh, that, that uh, I've been working on uh, called Dreamscape Learn, which is a social uh, immersive uh, three-dimensional project. Chapter four is the structures of art, technology, and science. And in this, uh, we basically break down the three domains um, and uh, in 23 different uh, dimensions uh, and, and compare the, the conduct and the processes uh, and, and basically how each of the domains work uh, so that if you're trying to understand you know, why uh, you know, why you have success in one domain and not in another, you can really understand you know, how, how incentives work, how rewards work, uh, how status works in each of the, in each of the domains. Um, and then converging domains to encourage creativity. What happens when we bring those worlds back together uh, uh, you know, and, and really uh, show, the, um, uh, you know, show what happens in a new kind of world uh, this is the work of uh, Lozano Hammer. Uh, and then thinking at the nexus in a complex world, what, you know, how, uh, how this new kind of practice allows us uh, to think about complexity and the challenges that we now face. Uh, and, then and then finally, lessons that cross domains, the kinds of uh, you know, challenges that we face uh, if we look across the domains, we can really learn the, the lessons uh, that can inform us uh, and help us to think uh, in new ways. 
Uh, and then really, this is an opportunity to step back and look at the entire picture and see uh, the challenges uh, ahead that, uh, you know, the one thing that we can be sure of uh, is that there will be challenges uh, and that we need to be prepared. And then you can see that the, that the book ends with a closing uh, image sequence as well. It also has a kind of uh, cinematic closing in the way that it opens. Okay. So one thing that is inevitable and is good is that when you look at the world with different lenses, those lenses may give you insights and even drive you to action in ways that conflict with each other. So next to thinking invariably requires that we have to deal with conflicting views. And we believe that the ability to embrace, reconcile opposite viewpoints is, one, is going to be one of the most important skills of this century. Uh, that seeing the whole and seeing parts shouldn't be opposed, that intuition and rationality should work together, imagination and discipline should work together. And this has been something that at least in the quantum mechanics world has been operating for a long, long time. The idea that something could potentially be two things at the same time and it becomes one when you adopt a single viewpoint. Now, all of this has to occur within the context of a world that is complex. And in order to define terms, let's define what is complicated and what's complex, okay? A complicated system, the ones on the left there, is a system that is designed with a blueprint in which each component has a function and that function is determined by the blueprint. So this a manual to guide repairs, maybe you have a way of diagnose failures. On the other hand, the systems on the right, school of fish, termites, the assembly of neurons that makes up the brain and ecology, these systems are complex. These systems are robust. They fail more gracefully than the complicated system. They are adaptable. Uh, a key example of that could be stem cells that could take on different functions depending on the environment. They, they are contextual. So the difference between complicated and complex is that in systems that are complex, you can look at the components of the system. Let's say school of fish, composed of fish, neurons. You go from here to here and there is something that happens when elements interact together that leads to something that you couldn't possibly have guessed by looking at individuals. And this is emergence. This is the single most important characteristic of complex systems. There are many lessons that have been accumulated over the last 20 years uh, that simple behaviors can produce complex outcomes. But one of the most important ones for us now is chaos and order can coexist. This is the idea of complementarity. And especially for people who are in managerial endeavors, is that organization can emerge without central control. So this idea of reconciling opposites, chaos and order, emergence and blueprint together. Now, there are three domains in here, art, technology, and science. There are a few things that cross across domains. Design is one. Engineering, I would say, crosses uh, more the science, technology, and a little bit of art. But there are lessons that you can draw when looking at one domain that will have implications for another one. So let's talk about lessons that cross domains. So I, I, I list a, a few in here, and I will go quickly through this. Uh, I'm going to single out just a couple of these. Uh, 
like learn how to adapt and thrive with constraints, uh, they pick a style and own it by be conscious of repetition. Uh, and this learn to see simplicity in complexity and complexity in simplicity. Understand how models help us to use simplicity and complexity, embrace opposites. These are all lessons, okay? And some of them, like these three, are lessons that you can derive based on what you know on science, complex systems. They be always on guard for unexpected connections. Uh, be prepared for large consequences stemming from it. So you can, you can write little essays about this, but in order to make them visually, in order to sort of remember some of these lessons, some of the most memorable ones, at least in our opinion, come from art, lessons from art. And so we will go through a few of these. Uh, we'll ex explain what from art are we talking about and then give you the lesson. So this is one. So these are Picasso's lithographs, uh, the series of 11. And this is the last lithograph. But if you have been paying attention to the dates in there, this is not the last. In fact, this is the first. This is the second one, third, and this is the last. So this is how they look together. So what's the lesson in here? And you can pick many other examples. This is one of the most memorable ones. Uh, in the book, we have another one that was done with a cow and it's probably 15 years earlier than this. Uh, uh, but the lesson in here is learn to see simplicity in complexity and complexity in simplicity. This is a very valuable lesson in our view. Uh, normally, you will see people who are good in seeing one side, they important thing is to train yourself to work on the other side as well. Another one in here. So this is Matisse, several sketches. There are many, many, many more of what became La Dance. There are two versions of this. One is in the Hermitage. Uh, the other one is in the MoMA. But Matisse sometimes would go to his studio, not particularly inspired, but he had to paint. That was the point of being in the studio. And he did at least a, <clears throat> a couple of paintings where this painting, La Dance, appears as a background of paintings that he did. This is one example. This is another example. So what's the lesson in here? The lesson is inspiration is overrated. The whole point of being an artist is working like hell. And some of the ideas sometimes will look magical, but very few people from the outside see all the sweat and perspiration that goes into doing something that looks effortless. <clears throat> Picasso again, Picasso at 17, or oh, sorry, 14, 17, I think it's maybe 22, 26, something like that, 40. Here we have Malevich. This is an early Malevich, sort of more advanced Malevich. Then you go into this, you probably think there is nowhere to go from here, but yes, there is, we have that. Um, Malevich had to go back when it became unacceptable to produce modern art in Russia. The only way that he had to rebel against the system was that his little signature will be a square dot, a square little thing at the corner. That became his signature, the way to rebel. 
So the lesson in here is start with a solid grounding or learn the craft and then set it aside. You, we use Picasso a lot. This is at the MoMA, it's called Baboon and Young. And if you look closely at the head, you will discover that this sculpture is done all with found objects that Picasso had. It's a bronze, but in order to cast the bronze, he used uh, handles of pitchers or jars. This is a toy car. In fact, he got two toy cars making the, the face of the baboon. Uh, pots and pans in here. The whole point is every piece is from somewhere else, but when put together, you create something in which the pieces get submerged into the final design and you can almost forget what the pieces are. The lesson in here is adapt, adopt and adapt. And the bad artist copy, great artist steal by Picasso is probably appropriate in here. There are many, many technologies uh, that they contain nothing really new in the components, but the assembly is what looks revolutionary. The iPhone was one example, for example, of that. Another example, this mother by the sea. This is in Chicago. The story is that when one of the partners of Skidmore, Owens and Merrill, the ones who designed the Sears Tower, the original Sears Tower, visited Picasso. Picasso said, he mentioned that this painting was in Chicago. He said, yeah, I remember that painting. Initially it was different. Um, I had something else in mind. And then when I stepped back and look at it, I decided that didn't work out. But if you want the piece that was the fragment in the painting, I give it to you. And so these two pieces are in Chicago, except that they rarely put them together. So initially there was this man holding a fish that the baby was trying to touch. I, I think this is an amazingly important lesson. It applies even to projects, management, committee decisions, the important thing is do not converge too quickly, step back and look at the entire picture. So there are tons of lessons in here coming from art that have implications on even science and technology. And the whole point of the book is really how these three domains intersect and can enrich each other. So let me put in here one example of something that is a fantastic synthesis of the three domains going together. Bruce. Well, this is the work of uh, George Lucas, really, the impact uh, of George Lucas. And uh, for us, you know, when we, when we discovered this map, it really was a kind of map of the nexus. Um, and especially of the wealth and impact that can be created when you master the Nexus. Um, I mean, Lucas sold one of the companies uh, for over $5 billion just recently. Um, and uh, Star Wars, um, Julia and I were just talking about it uh, in preparation for this, that Star Wars was actually created in 1977, which is really hard to believe. <clears throat> But if you look at all the different uh, technologies, companies, <clears throat> people who were produced in this kind of uh, creative effort, and uh, it's a kind of perfect example of the synthesis of art, technology, and science uh, that creates this kind of new world that you know, industrial light and magic comes out of that. Um, and out of that comes a whole new world, Pixar, um, Alien, uh, the Genesis effect. Um, I mean, just, you know, absolutely extraordinary um, uh, cultural products that really changed our 
uh, you know, kind of changed the landscape. Um, the, the, you know, the whole world of sound, what, what, um, uh, what, what Lucas was able to do in, in terms of sound um, really created a whole, you know, whole new technologies uh, and new companies that, uh, again, created enormous value. Um, so when you really think about um, the, the nexus in this way, um, you realize how, just how important it is to master this kind of language. So this is the central point in here, okay? Uh, you could argue that the role of education, hopefully everybody who is watching this uh, knows the value of educating yourself, learning after having had some training in some domain, continue learning. But the whole purpose of an education is to provide you with a pair of glasses to see reality. I mean, an economist will see the world in a different way than a visual artist will see it. And sometimes we are very, very successful with that pair of glasses. But having one pair of glasses determines the set of all possible ideas that you will ever have. And the point is, if you are managed to add a new pair of glasses, that set will expand. And there's no question that if you have a broader set of ideas, the possibility of having creative ideas will increase. Ideas that will not be similar to each other because if you are together with a group of people who are all similar, you will have lots of ideas, but they will be roughly aligned with each other. So the whole point of the book, if you want, is what things can happen when you add another pair of glasses. Uh, we are getting a sense based on who we have shown this, on how many different people from completely different backgrounds can resonate with the ideas. So we have to stop at five in the number of blurbs that we could put at the end of the book. So we have a writer, Daniel Pink, a bestseller author in the New York Times. He just had another book about regret. Then we have someone more from the technology side, the, the president and chief operating officer of SpaceX. Then the fellow who was the, when, the one who went to uh, your kind of north of you to accept the Nobel Prize for uh, peace, who was leading Doctors Without Borders. Then Paola Antonelli, who is like the, the, one of the most visible people from the MoMA, is the senior curator. And then Bob Langer, He's probably the person who has had the most inventions generated coming from an academic setting. He has licensed technologies to about 400 different companies. And one of his minor achievements, he's the founder of Moderna. So these, these people are very different from each other, but the book had something to resonate with each of them. So I think we kind of are more or less precisely on timing here, but we were happy to share, give you a bird's eye view of the contents of the book. And based on what I know, Kudan is probably a place that is a nexus thinking place. Uh, there are many things that come together in there to produce something that is more than the sum of the parts. So I'll stop sharing now and 
Uh, Bruce, if you have any closing comments, you can make them here and then we can answer questions. No, I think that really sums it up. Okay. Thank you, so. Thank you very much. So applause in, in Zoom is always awkward, but you can see people do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much. This is super, super inspiring. Um, I personally was looking forward very, very much to this. Uh, when I met uh, Julian Moutinho the first time in 2012 at the uh, NetSci conference in a podium discussion, very widely, um, I, I, I had this really uncanny feeling. It's, it's very, very, very rare. That you encounter somebody who's interested in all the things you're interested in when you're interested in everything um, um, and has been very successful in all of them and um, so this is something coming together that is really amazing and uh, when Julian Emotinho shared with me that Bruce Mao is the designer in this book which also heavily influenced me because I think SML Excel was one of the first architecture books I bought when I studied um, it's and it's for many, this has been, you know, like a picture book. People have looked at it and follow up content. Um, this has been heavily influential for people. And maybe to open the discussion. Um, so, George Lucas, in a, in a Wired magazine article, um, in, when episode one came out, um, so he was interviewed um, and he said, now we get all the parts. And he was referring to this kind of picture, basically. Uh, now we got all the parts, and now we have to play a symphony, which I found so inspiring. I had this on my light switch for like years, so I look at it every day. Uh, and now, I, you know, from that moment onward, the 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 premise was I need to collect the parts and then play a symphony. Uh, it was a little downer that episode one was his first symphony because it wasn't that good. <laughs> But, you know, we're still going, I guess. Um, but that is sort of something which we try to achieve here also, having people from all sorts of uh, disciplines. And um, obviously we face a challenge, like everybody who embarks on this is exactly this kind of thing that we, yes, we need multiple glasses in order to understand better, but A, having multiple glasses on your head is sort of weird. Uh, and then people think like you're not either one or the other. And like, Letting it roll out, I think, is a, is a really difficult task. Mm -hmm. I will um, give the word to Mila Oiba, who is our uh, resident cultural historian, uh, who has question number one, which is sort of one end of the spectrum. I guess. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Super inspiring talk. I'm 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 really thrilled. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, as, as uh, Maximilian said, I'm I'm cultural historian working at Kudan. And um, actually my question is kind of like, I wanted you to um, maybe elaborate a little bit more, um, you know, as um, I couldn't agree more that it is very important to kind of um, learn lessons from, from other disciplines as well in order to expand our understanding. So, uh, but I, I would like to understand, do you mean that uh, each individual should kind of like, uh, try to learn uh, some other disciplines or, or um, uh, even kind of like, you know, from technology or art or, or so on, kind of like their way of thinking? Or uh, do you think that it is done um, more from the, you know, in a way of, of collaborating with people from, from different disciplines? And whichever is your, your answer. So if the answer is that each individual should kind of like try to, you know, go beyond and, and try to understand what would be uh, your suggestion for a person like from, you know, myself from cultural history. Yeah, uh, I, can, and, I, can, I can tackle this, then I'll let Bruce. So okay, first, yeah. of all, first of all, everything that we have said applies to individuals and teams, okay? So you can have individuals who are, let's say, nexus thinkers, but you can have teams who the whole team is like a nexus team. Uh, one example that we put in the book. So by the way, the answer is 
no, if you are a technologist, you shouldn't try to convert yourself into an artist, but you should really try to understand how artists think. Because we all come equipped with stereotypes about other domains. Uh, from the art side, you think that science is cold and rational, driven by logic. They cannot understand the value of, value of intuition that it plays, the, the thrill that you get when some theory comes together or when you complete a proof or something. Uh, it's probably the same kind of excitement that when you put a composition together and you hear it play for the first time. So understanding how other people think is the most important thing. But regarding the teams, one example that we cover in the book uh, that comes from a friend of mine, uh, the example is almost now 20 years old. There is an example of documented outcomes of team production and creativity, and that's net, uh, Broadway musicals, okay? Uh, to put a Broadway show, you need a team of about five people. You need a producer, you need a librettist, you need a choreographer, uh, you need all of these people working together. Uh, you need a director. You could argue that the director who sits in between the producer, the producer is the person who is interested. We made an investment on this, this better work. The producer, you will say is more left brain than the choreographer who is more right brain and the director has to sit in between all of them. Uh, the, what you produce <clears throat> cannot be something in which you put a whole bunch of creative people and they throw 50 ideas, none of them being possibly realizable, or putting one idea and killing it to death, making sure it works. You need, you need the assembly of things. And people have studied these teams because you know with every Broadway musical that was produced, who was part of the team, and you know how successful it was, how many shows it ran, and you can even have clues as to what's a big mix of people to produce something. Um, it's hard to put this in precise mathematical terms, but if you have successful teams and you keep using the successful team, that's not a good idea. Have a team of all people who are new, they find each other for the first time in there, is not good either. So you need a mix of people who are veterans and newcomers. And you need to constantly refresh this. So the, the, regarding the question is, the most important thing is to understand how others think. Not that you become like them, but understand how they is that they think about problems. And the other one is everything that we say applies to individuals and applies to teams. Obviously, we think that having some Nexus people is essential going forward because those are the people who can understand all the components and move together. But I will let Bruce elaborate this. Then there is a question from Carlos in there. Bruce. Yeah, sure. The, I mean, for me, the, the, the notion of symphony that, um, uh, that was mentioned earlier is a really good kind of metaphor to think about, that um, what Nexus requires is orchestration. Um, and for orchestration, you need to know the instruments. So, um, so what you're, we're really uh, helping uh, you know, and suggesting is to say, um, let's have a kind of open mind to the instruments across the spectrum so that we can, we can start to, um, to, to kind of learn the language. And I think for me, the language is such an important issue because um, we need to be open to the language, but also within our disciplines, we need to 
we need to change the language to make it open for others. Um, so much of the language have, has become um, closed to the outside world. Um, and, you know, kind of even aggressively so to, to kind of make it um, cult-like um, and make it difficult for others to enter. Um, and, and this is, you know, this was identified a long time ago. C.P. Snow uh, wrote early on about the, the, the solitudes and how, so I, I think that, that, um, that gaining a mastery of the language allows you to move and to think like others um, and to and, uh, you know, put those glasses on and take them off when need be um, without becoming, a, you know, without an artist becoming a scientist, but, but to really be able to kind of live in their world and, and to learn from them and make, them make, make new things. And the kind of incentive for that, you know, the reason for that is that the new challenges don't fit the disciplines. You know, the challenges that we face are not going to fit into our academic structure. Uh, we need to actually create new structures and new capacities across the disciplines if we're going to face the, the, the new higher order complexity challenges that we, that we now face. Thank you very much. This, this is very, very much going straight to the heart of what we're, what we're doing here. Uh, my uh, experience at Barabasi uh, for network science was that if you enter as a physicist and you do biological networks, you exit as a biophysicist. You're neither a physicist nor a biologist. Nobody wants you. But now there is enough biophysicists that you have your own journals. And so multidisciplinarity very much seems to work that way. So there will be the cults that will sort of exclude you, but there will be a, a new tribe. And talk about that. So Carlos is the next up. Uh, I met Carlos uh, not quite a year ago. He is one of the co-initiators of a new multidisciplinary society called SEMF, predominantly started by mathematicians, but to include all sorts of disciplines very much in tradition of things like Leonardo around Kepesh in Molina, um, Black Mountain College, The Edge, which is now tainted by uh, who was at the center. But so there is this sort of new um, movements and it seems to be that the multidisciplinary crowd is sort of like edging on. Um, and so Carlos, you got a question. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Max, uh, for the introduction. Uh, so indeed, uh, this, uh, this talk was extremely inspiring for someone like myself, who is uh, relatively young and trying to get this thing off the ground. Uh, SEMF stands for the Spanish acronym for um, Society for Multidisciplinary and Fundamental Research. So we are really trying to uh, build this sort of uh, community uh, and platform where uh, you can really transcend the boundaries, especially in science, but uh, we really want to push for art and other kinds of uh, forms of creativity. So, uh, I mean, this this was extremely inspiring, I should say. I mean, I'll, I'll try to get the book as soon as possible. It's uh, it's really, really, um, I mean, top notch. I mean, I'm, I'm very glad that Max invited me to, to, to join the seminar. Um, and by the way, uh, the fact that uh, you used George Lucas as the example is really close to my heart. I mean, I was eight when episode one came out. So I was the same age as the actor that was playing Anakin. So it's, very, it's a very uh, sort of, although the movie indeed is not the greatest, but uh, it's, it's very close to my heart. So the question I have is to do with your um, classification of, of sort of the realms. So you, we have this art, science, and, um, and technology realms. And, and I find it interesting that um, I think the, the diagrams that you drew, uh, the, the, the surveying diagrams, I think that they are very explanatory, but I would claim uh, that perhaps they need to be compactified in a way. So I think that there is, and perhaps mathematics is the overlap that is sort of not showing explicitly there because, uh, and so I wanted to, to ask uh, for your comments on where you think uh, pure mathematics stands and, and whether you think that uh, the overlap uh, between art and science uh, because in the, in, the, in, the, in the diagram, it didn't, it didn't show explicitly. Um, no. uh, so, so, yeah. again, Some uh, we, we mentioned math. I wouldn't say a lot, but it's there. Um, I mean, there, there are a few things that have to be mentioned explicitly. Architecture, for example, you would argue that spans domains in there. So with math, the central question is 
is math invented or discovered. And, and among mathematicians, they split almost halfway in between the two, okay? Uh, but I would argue that in terms of creativity, of pulling things out of thin air, you could argue writing is part of that. Math is supreme, it's kind of at the top. Uh, we mentioned a few things. Math obviously is made an appearance in one of the lessons in terms of the models and learn to see the value of simple models in understanding complexity. So math is unique. It's, um, first of all, almost everything in art evolves. There are things that you put up to level, they are there, they form part of the canon of our history. There are revisions in there, some things that they were regarded as amazing in their time, they get revised and math, math is forever. <laughs> it's once something gets proved. Um, I mean, we mentioned one story in, in the book. Um, this is mathematician David Hilbert. Uh, one of the greatest mathematicians, German mathematician. And he meets a colleague and the colleague asks, uh, so what happened with your student X? And he said, oh, he, he did not have mass, enough imagination to be a mathematician. He's now a poet and he's doing fine. So uh, I put math really at the top in there, but it's singular because of this dichotomy invented or discovered. Uh, and there are many things, for example, you could argue algorithms in, emerging from theoretical computer science, they are invented. On the other hand, there are many things in math with number theory that they are not a human creation. They were there and you lift the veil and you reveal what was there. And there are some really interesting quotes on that coming from mathematicians. Yeah. So if I could add very briefly to what you just said, I think that th this split of invented or discovered is, is really showing something that, I mean, to the point that Max made that we're mostly mathematicians originally in, in our society, we think that this, this fact is really showing that the nexus is necessary, is that there's a point where being formally rigorous or being scientific or being imaginative is sort of really immaterial. You're really living at the very center and, and you have to inhabit all, this, all these modes. I yeah, agree, I agree, yeah. Yeah, there's one other thing that I, I would like to clarify in terms of the design and architecture. Uh, for me, when I use the word design, uh, it's really in the broadest sense. Um, if you think about our design culture, um, you know, when you have a goal, uh, when, as soon as you have a specific goal in mind, uh, you've become a designer. Uh, and then the, you know, so we, the, the design methodology is the ability to envision a future and systematically execute the vision. Whether that's an, a building, uh, you know, a technology, uh, uh, you know, whatever that product outcome is. Um, so the design, you know, when we think about the design practices, um, you know, cinema is there, architecture is there, you know, the kind of creative practices where you have a goal and you're producing that outcome. So the, uh, in, the, in the popular view, many people equate design with objects, like the chairs that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. They don't equate design with processes or systems, mm -hmm. objects. And they equate in the same way that in the popular conception, they equate 
art with creation, and no artist will really equate art with creation. Creation is a byproduct. Or even worse, equate design with beauty, as if that was the objective, that's a byproduct. They, there are all of these misconceptions coming from when people look at things from other domains. Uh, you can elaborate on the beauty part, Bruce, if you want. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that, that we, you know, when we think about beauty in our practice, um, we talk about beauty as a strategic idea. Mm -hmm. Um, and we ask our clients, you know, what is your beauty strategy? Um, almost no one has an idea. Almost no one has an answer to that question. Uh, they don't think of beauty as a strategic idea. Uh, they think of it as a side effect or a kind of uh, condiment that you add to a project at the end, uh, a kind of icing on the cake. Um, but if you think about Apple as a business, uh, if you took beauty out of Apple, you would have a reasonably good technology company that you had never heard of. Uh, but when you put beauty into Apple, you have the most valuable company in human history. Um, and there's a reason that their products say designed in California. Um, and, and that's really because the, they had a beauty strategy. Um, and to me, it's really stunning that the business world has not, uh, has not learned the lesson, you know, that that the company that really produced the most value in history uh, really did it with beauty. Yes. So Marek has a question. So maybe I should introduce Marek. Marek, without Marek, we wouldn't be here. Marek Tom is uh, one of the two to three people that got the initial funding for Kudan before I was hired. He's a semiotician. And so here, there's three schools working together in the university, which is not very typical. Like, it's not like in the sense, oh, let's collaborate because, but there really is a want to do so. And I think what you bring in, Marek, is this openness as a, you're not Manian sort of semiotician, nevertheless have to see this nexus, to use the word, with complexity science, and taking digital humanities beyond digital and beyond humanities. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Max. And, and of course, thank you very much for your talk. And I look very much forward to reading the book, which is indeed uh, about what we are going to do here. But I have one comment and, and, and one question. Uh, the comment is, is actually about the way you, you described how artists work. Uh, explaining that it's very much about constant reinvention from the scratch and, and avoiding to sit on the, sh on the shoulders of, of, of giants. And I, I agree, this is the way how most of the artists tend to describe themselves. But I wonder whether it's actually true in the sense that we all know that to be really creative, really original, you have to, to know the previous tradition and mm -hmm. and I would maybe claim that also artists are in many respects standing on the shoulders of giants that maybe they just don't you know make it explicit uh, as scientists too yeah but my question is is maybe more uh, specific it's it's actually a, about how do you define the concept of science in your in your approach because as you know science different languages has different meaning. German Wissenschaft is much more comprehensive than the English science. And of course, I'm asking because being myself a humanities scholar, I wonder what is the role of humanities in your uh, scheme, let's say, and whether science includes also humanities or humanities rather on the side of arts, or is there any role at all for humanities in, in your three realm scheme? Thank you. Wow, oh, there, there are uh, lots of questions. Well, I should have written them down. <laughs> but let, let, me, let me start with the last one, since you said um, you come from humanities. Uh, I, I have to give a talk to a humanity group now. Let, let me give you the following example. I, I wrote many, many years ago, maybe, I think it was 2007, something like that. 
a piece that appeared in Forbes with the title, we need more Renaissance scientists. And it was, uh, it was to argue that in most places when you do a PhD, at least in the US, you get supported by some funding agency, you work for an advisor and they are reporting mechanisms the idea that you have to wonder and explore things outside what you do is, is rare. And I, I, I was wondering whether or not someone, I, in fact, I talked with NSF to see if they could have more exploration, this and that, okay? So the piece was, so, was seen by a young professor in humanities in Stanford of name Dan Edelstein. And he wrote a piece, he wrote about this twice. And one piece was called From Iphigenia to the iPhone. Okay? You can Google it, you can find it. And I, I exchanged some ideas with him. And I, I, I felt almost responsible because he wrote this pre-tenure and I thought, this, this is not a good idea to kind of put your cards. But one example that he mentioned in there was he had a student in, in, in a course that he was teaching and he was teaching French something. And he, he gave the students an assignment. Uh, tell me what you think about, or oh no, there was something that Rousseau wrote. And some Chinese students came and said, surely someone did this before. I he had to explain, no, I want your own interpretation on the ideas. That's the value that humanities bring, okay? It is the ability to look at something that has been looked by thousand people before, and you have to come up with your own angle on things, the ability to dissect things, even see contradictions. So I, I think the things fit really well within the structure that we're talking about in here. And we make some references to this. Uh, I mean, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the danger of writing a book like this is that someone reads a book from neuroscience, and there is enough neuroscience in here that you could crucify us, okay? Because you cannot say enough. But the same thing happens when you talk about math, humanities. I think humanities brings the idea that you have to work with ideas. Uh, one of the lessons was do not converge too quickly. Uh, have to have the ability to look at several ideas. I mean, there's no big value in solving correctly a problem if it happens to be the wrong problem to solve. So I think that that component is the most valuable there. Uh, regarding science, uh, the definition, I think one of the, the biggest, I think science, for better or for worse, has an image in the popular imagination. An engineer does not, in, but the boundary is very blurry. But one of the biggest misconceptions in science is the scientific method. People believe that science operates with scientific method. It does not. It, for some things is fine, but many things in science, especially in theory, is about induction. It's about, uh, uh, I mean, Newton didn't come with his gravitational theories based on the scientific method. Is you come up with an idea that somehow you stripped out of all kind of uh, things that anchor it. <laughs> to something specific and you think this will apply everywhere. So in theory, scientific method doesn't apply. Uh, 
And in many cases, even what you're doing, what I will call, I mean, I work on things that you could call scientific, in fact, very much to the annoyance of my son, who is a physicist. If you Google me, I will appear as a physicist in the internet. Uh, but it's more like ah, no. a curiosity. So I don't know if I, I mean, you, you had several questions, but the, the, the role of humanities is pretty clear. You benefit a lot by, and I, I wrote at least one piece with one of our biggest humanities colleagues in here about the intersection between uh, engineering and humanities, for example. I can send it to you. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Yes. No, that's fine. Okay. I would like to go back to bring this all together, including the humanities. There is one common denominator in your book, which is uh, design. Um, and it's not just design in the broadest sense, but it's also design in a graphical sense. And so in some sense, there's this thing that in computer science, people write algorithms, you know, physicists write mathematical equations, uh, humanists write text, including art historians, artists do painting about painting. Gerhard the famously say, in order to understand painting, you need to paint more. Uh, so the key thing is there is some kind of common denominator. And the example you gave, the Harry uh, Holtzman transformation, um, journal from the 50s. But Ed Reinhardt and Alfred Barr, Alfred Barr, who did the Barr diagram at the MoMA, ironically based on Picasso's bull. Uh, Ed Reinhardt the, doing these diagrams. The TIFF distribution, which is a, you know, iconic thing, which, you know, we all imagine as a straight line on a plot. So, there is a common language, which is graphics and figures and, and, and drawings, diagrams. Is that something which you would say is a fundamental thing, not just like how you design the book, uh, but, but something we need as a common ground? Do we have to teach every humanist, every physicist, every computer scientist also how to draw? You are getting into the wheelhouse of Bruce in here, so I let Bruce <laughs> <laughs> I'll do this one. Um, it's a that's a very interesting question, actually. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that we uh, do in our workshops often uh, is give people the capacity to sketch. And if you think about, you know, when you are first, you know, as a child, uh, the first impulse you do. That you have is to make marks. Um, so you know, the, as soon as you can sit vertically, you make marks, and you you know you 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 you're, if you're given a crayon, you will make something um, and give meaning to it, uh, and you're certain that that's a a picture of mom, and you love it, and she loves it too, um, and you have this incredible uh, capacity to make marks and meaning. Um, and we strip that away from you in our educational process. We, we, we teach you that you can't do it. Um, and we teach you that you can't sketch and that you can't explore things visually um, when it's such a powerful tool for, uh, for, for a number of reasons. One of which is that it's social. Uh, the moment that you make a visual thing um, everyone in the room can can share it. You know, we can make a visual now, hold it up, and everyone can share it instantly. Uh, whereas other forms, you know, text and other forms, uh, we have to really process it uh, individually. Um, and so you have this incredible capacity for um, accelerating thinking in the visual language. Um, and um, what the case that we make is that. You don't need to know how to draw to sketch. Sketch is uh, low resolution ideas, fast and cheap. 
It's not about rendering. It's not about knowing how to render things. It's about low resolution ideas, fast and cheap. And so um, everyone should have the access to that idea, uh, to that capacity, because it will accelerate your work uh, and, and will accelerate the, the work of the individual and the team. And so for me, the, the kind of language, uh, the visual language is such an important part of, uh, of all the disciplines now. And we don't really kind of make a, a clear effort uh, to help people master it. So there is one more thing that I would add here. And, um, and it has some connections with the question that I was asked about math. The example that I mentioned is a friend named Lagrange. Lagrange is one, there are a few people who came with things that have similar standing than when you talk about Newtonian mechanics, okay? So you can talk about Hamiltonian mechanics or Lagrangian mechanics. So Lagrange was one of those giants. And he wrote a book. And in the book preface, he said, you shall find no pictures in this book. <laughs> and the, the reason was that if an idea uh, in mathematical terms acquires final shape, and it's the last part of the theorem. Uh, pictures may have been good in driving the idea forward. Maybe, they, maybe, maybe Lagrange sketched a few things, but in the final instance, the pictures were removed. No, no sense of the scaffold remained. The pictures were seen as weakening the argument. Uh, mathematics should stand in this uh, list of symbols, which are more, you can fill them with your own content. And the picture is kind of more ready. They are like crutches. Uh, so in my own work, uh, I put lots of pictures of the things. And at the beginning, I have to argue for the pictures, why they were there. Now everybody uses pictures to the point that has become almost overused. Uh, but the, the ability to use pictures to think, I think is essential. So you, I'd like to follow up on this. So your, your book is actually in the tradition of this Frankl and Tietjen's 1934 hydrodynamics, which is full of pictures. It's the other philosophy of the fluid dynamics, taking pictures, 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 because you cannot describe them so easily. Mm -hmm. And there is a gap of until 1989, where your chaotic mixing book comes out. And so again, as an artist, you do that kind of stuff. So you must, this must feel very close to home. Uh, there is this, dichotomy of modeling, mathematical modeling, and observing. And often, like I, I, my first funding application in, in complex networks got rejected because I basically made the premise, there's lots of art research databases. They're full of complex networks, and I just want to quantify them. I want to look at them, and I want to draw them. Yeah. And then they said, oh, yeah, there's no modeling. And the modelers at that point in time, around 2009-ish, they actually never looked at the data. So there is this kind of like, is it, do we need both? And need, is both, has both uh, have to happen at the same time? Yeah. So, so you do both in your book, right? <laughs> okay, question there. Yeah, yeah, well, more comment than a question, actually, because uh, uh, something which you just said, it sort of invoked my um, own personal uh, mathematical training. 
And actually, uh, I would say that there are two sides of the problem. Yes, so, so on the one side, uh, pictures allow to uh, to get a very good intuition and, and some sort of uh, some sort of um, insight into what's going on, which you cannot get in other way. But in other way, in, uh, um, in, there is another side, and that is probably why some people think that pictures weaken argument, because, because pictures can mislead. Uh, you might see something in the, in the picture and believe that it is, it is something universal, uh, although it is actually one particular example of the thing you're looking at. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so it is, uh, I, I sort of very strongly agree that good pictures are extremely important in, in, in producing thinking and as people around here know I cannot speak without without chalk in my hand basically. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, uh, but on, on the other hand uh, we, sh we must be aware of the fact that uh, that one particular picture can be misleading and if you can draw something it is not it doesn't mean that you are winning argument just by drawing it. yeah. No, I, I agree with that. So, the, so Hadamard wrote this book on the psychology of mathematical invention. And I think he commented that in Hilbert's work, you can find pictures everywhere. And in Biestras, you cannot find a single picture anywhere. Uh, I wish I knew more of people who produce something that looks perfect at the end, where not they were in the way that they were thinking, things that ended in the wastebasket, they use some picture in the process of thinking about what they did, like I don't know, Riemann, for example. But I, I completely agree that at the end, the only reason to put a picture is to help the reader, <laughs> sometimes to guide them. This is what I was thinking about. Uh, but there, at the end, you can remove them. You, you, don't need, you don't need to have it in math, okay? But if you want to educate, and if you want people to get in the, your brain, and this is how I was thinking about, they're extremely valuable. But the idea that, remember when I said at the beginning, in art, everything that you have done is valuable. Art historians will go and catalog every piece of paper, that someone left as a trail of the idea that uh, led to something there. And this is why in exhibits, you curate them and you put all of these. That's not so in, in science and math. Uh, very, very rarely you have an annotated copy of the iterations of a manuscript. I mean, once come for auction and people, because at the end it doesn't matter. But if you want to know how people are thinking, and this is the problem when we educate students in science, uh, you, you teach the final thing that is perfect in there, stands by itself, but you don't, get a, you don't give a sense on all the dead leads that something may have had in arriving at that point, uh, what things were conceived, imagined, developed, and then eventually discarded. And I think that if we could see more of that, it would be much more uh, useful to see how people think. Uh, but it's very hard. Uh, there are a few people who are very good at explaining how they think, OK? Uh, Hadamard wrote that book on the, the psychology of mathematical inventions. And one guy who appears prominently there is Poincaré, because Poincaré was one person who would explain how he came with ideas. But there are many people who are amazingly good who cannot really explain how they think. But it's mostly from the point of view of educating people, inspiring people, uh, making them seem more human, uh, that is not like something just 
came as a whole in one shot. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the biggest problem that people have from the outside about math, they don't see the role of intuition in math. They, they just don't see it. They think it's all about logic. Or if you are very rational and logic, you must be a really good mathematician. No, a good mathematician is someone who imagines the theorem, then has good hunches, and then you go and prove it. And if it works, you got something. Many times you have hunches that go nowhere. So it has to do with the idea that we are talking about really understanding how other people think. I have just a follow-up for, for this uh, conversation about diagrams because I find it fascinating. I love your example of Lagrange. I actually, I mentioned this in my PhD because my background is in Hamiltonian and Lagrangian mechanics. And uh -huh. it's, it's actually, I, I would say that Lagrange did a lot of harm to theoretical physics because he was not only claiming that he was proud that there were no diagrams in, uh -huh. in, in mechanic analytic. I mean, it, I mean, this has, has affected theoretical physics for more than a century afterwards. Um, I would say though that, um, Diagrams made a comeback. Uh, the the you know Feynman had uh, Feynman diagrams even before category theory was popularized, and then category theory absolutely exploded in in mathematics. So I think there's there's now we're we're, we're and obviously not theory. For example, uh, people use knots as as computational engines uh, now more than something to study. Um, I think there's a, there's a good story here to tell. I'm not an expert, so I couldn't tell it myself. Yeah, but the, the one who wrote a book, uh, an article on this is. Um... Oh boy, um, this is art historian in Harvard. I think he's still alive. Um, Gerald Holton. And he wrote a couple of pieces on visual imagination in science. Um, I don't remember the example that he uses. There is one that he used that we use prominently in the book, which is Galileo and Harriot and the moon. Uh, but he mentioned several other ones. Um, and yeah, Feynman is one in which, if you see one of the diagrams, you almost, it's a, the diagram kind of, connects you with the ideas that he had, just, just, just by seeing it, yeah. Maybe, maybe I, yeah. Okay, you now maybe I give the word to Mark Collins, who is an artist. Hello, very inspiring talk. Um, I really, I need to read the book. I think it will be a very good source for my PhD. Uh, I am an art, a practicing artist. Uh, uh, I do interactive art since uh, a decade long. And uh, well, I know some of the examples you, you show, uh, and some others. Um, and, and recently, I'm more working in, in artificial intelligence and uh, doing artistic pieces uh, using artificial intelligence. Uh, like one, uh, I think, will be shown in, in the I, I will publish in SIGGRAPH in, 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 in summer because I got approval yesterday, a long paper uh, about our installation that we, we premiere in Tabacalera in San Sebastián in December, which uh, converts dreams into paintings, uh, like trying to attempting to, to interpret dreams uh, of, of people, like an interactive uh, pieces. And I, I don't know, uh, my reflection about the like being a practicing artist, and actually I, ha I had worked uh, for, for three years in, in Future Lab, it's the Ars Electronica um, like lab where I develop things for the museum and for companies and so on. Um, is that the, even I think that the, the art and technology for my understanding is really important because actually it, it brings together the, the problems of now and, and, and it, it can explain the situations that we we are dealing in society more than than any other medium, uh, especially to that uh, we using the latest technology that has the imprint of the moment of now, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and it can talk about the problems, like when you talk about, when you do a piece now with artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. you, you, you really can tackle like the problems that we are facing now with the, with the society, because like we are artists now, they're actually adopting the latest um, models and, and, and subverting and modifying and sometimes even coming with the new modifications of it. But I, I must say that um, looking at the scientists, for example, of artificial intelligence, they don't take serious the artists. Uh, although some people like, like me, uh, they have even uh, a studies in computer science. Mm -hmm. I, I do have, um, I did a study with uh, Christian Loran in, in, in Austria. Uh, I don't know if you know, it's a uh, pioneers in, in, in media art, doing artificial intelligence and life um, systems and so on. Uh, but, but I have the feeling that in, 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 in one side, in the, in the academia, in, for example, computer science and, and artificial intelligence people, they, they do have a, a workshop on, on creativity um, in, in the neurics uh, every year, but there's still not a main track on the, um, on, on the conference. It's not a, there is no a main track in the conference. It's just like a workshop in the side. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and then, and then uh, in the in the art centers, which uh, I had been going in, in many, I had exhibited in Barbican, I had exhibited in in New York in the art and design. Um, there's still also very little curators who do understand what we are doing, mm -hmm. and this is a problem. Because the, the uh, like me major museums, uh, they don't program um, all this new kind of, of art, even if it's not new. Actually, it's not new. Um, mm -hmm. uh, they just uh, are very good uh, retrospective uh, of. Um, I always forgot the name. This physicist that this, uh, started uh, computational uh, art in uh, and now in Linz. Uh, they finally did a retrospective. Uh, he was very overlooked. Um, and yeah, uh, there's so promising from, things, but there's also also like um, uh, somehow I, I feel that it's still like we are not not well looked uh, on 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 the art, for example, in the science. I mean, you you had lots of things in there, but uh, I, I want to comment on a couple of things that I did not mention. One of the things that is important to understand about artists now, um, because we have had lots of things in which we have done, we have put teams, people, science, engineering, and artists, is at the beginning, the, the people from the science and engineering, they were amazed on how good some of these, it's a self-selected group of artists, how good they were with things that have to do with coding. And they, they, I think what is important to understand is if there is something to be learned, artists will learn it, okay? But the other part that is more now than ever, there are many artists who are very entrepreneurial and that presents an opportunity to connect with them in, in ways that in the past was less clear. Yeah, it, it, in the book we get into the connections between Poincaré and Duchamp and Picasso and all of those things. But the, the fact that artists now are more entrepreneurial than before and that, I do not know if you, believe in the no technique before need, but if they, they if there is something to be learned, they will learn it. And I think that's important. One thing that, by the way, that I, I, I think I should mention before we leave, because it's a comment about the world now. Remember when I mentioned the difference between complicated and complex. Complicated was a nuclear sub in which pieces do not adapt, a, a complex system being an ecology in which the systems adapt within bounds to things. Uh, by that, I mean that if a piece fails in a nuclear sub, um, neighboring pieces will not somehow inspire the new piece to acquire 
to fill the function that didn't have before. If you don't want something to fail, you have to back it up once or twice. The world used to be complicated. There were lots of nodes, but the connection between those nodes were kind of weak. The world now is complex because we are connected by financial networks, supply chains, the internet. Uh, 50 years ago, something happened in China, didn't affect much the rest of the world. Now we're seeing the consequences of a hyper-connected world and what, how things do not stay in one location. They just, and understanding that is also essential to understand the world today. Computer yeah, vision. Uh, hello, thank you. Oh, by the way, can I, can I mention one thing? Uh, you mentioned artificial intelligence. And of, of course, we, we mentioned artificial intelligence in, in the book. In, of course, the comment that I made before about not being able to lift everything to the level of, because the book, the boundary conditions were 360 pages, 200 color plates. That's it. Just decide what you want to put within those constraints. So we get into AI. And one thing that is happening now in the boundary between this complicated and complex, the more AI you put in a plane, the more the, it will bridge the complicated and the complex. Uh, and so there are lots of things that will be there kind of in between, in the in-between category. So uh, those two extremes exist, but there are lots of things that will be in the middle. Okay, so Ahmad. Yeah, uh, it, uh, really it was a nice talk. And I wanna ask that uh, you said that uh, most of the complex systems are simple and most of the simple systems are more complex or stuff like this. And I actually want to ask, did you mention, sorry, did you mention any mathematical model uh, for the nexus of the three, three disciplines or three domains? Actually, I am from the engineering background and then from the computer science. And uh, uh, most of the times uh, our uh, engineering or technological solution, they comes from the uh, from the nature just for example the radar system is based on the concept from the uh, movement of the bats and that have been interpreted but this is 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 a simple concept but to implement this concept is not so simple there mm -hmm. are there there are a lot of effort and a lot of things that involve to implement this simple concept into a reality into technology and the same like the self-driving cars to talk about the self-driving cars is simple, but to make it practical and pragmatic, it's a real is a real challenge. So that that's the the thing that uh, what I get from this all the talk. Although I have not uh, yet uh, received the book, uh, I have not uh, cannot say anything about the book. But what I get from your talk is it not the oversimplification of the complex thoughts that 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 uh, uh, that all the discussion that we have just three different disciplines and they have been, they could and they could be mixed in some way, but uh, uh, or you have provided some model that how they, they could be could be mixed uh, to solve the real world problems. Uh, have you devised any mathematical or some sort of model for that, your take on it? So I, I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but I, I think that from the point of view of educating people about how you can understand the world in terms of models. Um, I think most people will not understand what goes, for example, into a 
all the details that go into a flight simulator, for example. But if you tell them, you know, a flight simulator incorporates a lot of knowledge that we have our mechanics and free dynamics and, and is a model on how a plane will behave under different conditions, people will say, wow, yeah, I, I, I understand this. On the other hand, people do not understand the value of simple models that are the ones that eventually give birth to these more hyper-realistic complicated models. So for example, if you try to explain someone in the street the value of what the icing model is, most people will have no clue. However, if you try to understand, the, to explain something like hyper-realistic simulation or even virtual reality or something like that, people say, yeah, I understand this. But they don't understand what went into it from uh, the theoretical underpinning. So it's kind of weird. They, they, will, they will understand hyper-realistic things, but they will not understand the value of simple things. For example, they will not understand that somehow within what, what governs a pendulum, you have almost embedded all Newtonian mechanics, okay? So uh, there's a little bit of that that we get into the, into the, uh, into the book because uh, the, the whole point, as I said, is to educate people from the other side, uh, the idea of the pair of glasses and give a glimpse on how is that, I don't know, a theoretical physicist may think about something. But may, may not say that every knowledge is not for everyone. Uh, everyone who wants to learn or who wants to be specific, that, then uh, he, he exerts the effort and come into that. And to learn that, you have to be specific. You have to deep, dig deep into knowledge. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I, I like to, uh, you know, every once in a while, uh, quote Einstein, who said, things should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. And that's, uh, that last phrase is really critical. Right? Yeah. I, I think we, we mostly miss the first part of that. You know, it goes back to our, our discussion earlier about language. You know, we would rather be... Um, we would rather be uh, complicated and difficult rather than do the hard work of simplicity. Yeah. Most people confuse complicated. I mean, this applies to a lot of people in academia, okay? Most people confuse complicated with profound. Mm -hmm. Although yes. the, the history of science yeah. is made by people who did the simplest thing first. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mark Metz, who is a PhD student, is also a statistician. Yeah. Well, thank you for the interesting talk and nice discussions. So about the, the your idea that the world uh, world around us is becoming more and more complex. And that's why we need to uh, understand these uh, complex systems to, to actually understand the world around us. But, I mean, for me, it's if you think that now world is uh, becoming more complex, all of the cultural, biological, everything. Uh, but what, what if the complexity is, uh, what if the thing is that we just begun to, uh, only now we're becoming aware uh, that there's complex systems around us, right? And maybe it's also connected to that the complex uh, cultural systems that we often look at uh, are the ones that we uh, are sort of more accessible us that are around us right now. And maybe one of the big, big factors is just uh, what is uh, white mics might seem that now the world is more complex is because of sort of, sort of all sorts of accelerations like uh, more technology, et cetera, turning up. But the complex systems have already been there, just that the sort of the turnover time that let's say that the, I don't know, system has a, a feedback 
loop that closes itself, it takes a longer time and it's really hard to detect these complex systems. So mm -hmm. do, do you agree with this? Well, I, I think that we live surrounded by technologies that we don't really understand. I mean, what we are doing now, if you had shown people this eight years ago, maybe Orwell would have predicted this, but with, this will seem magical, but no one understands the components that are going to produce in something like this, like the Zoom talk. Uh, so we are more and more dependent on systems that we barely understand. And I think it's important to recognize that more and more things are connected in ways that um, can have surprising consequences. Sometimes the consequences are not that hard to predict. For example, uh, you know how much cobalt there is in every electric car now. And you know how much lithium there is in an electric car now. So if the technologies for the cars continue evolving in this linear way, the technology being the same, you can more or less predict how much lithium do you need to extract from the planet to reach that production of cars. And the answer is <laughs> you, you don't have enough. <laughs> and unfortunately, a lot is in China uh, then it's Chile and Argentina, but uh, so the, 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 the world is much more connected and what you do in one place affects other things. I think is much more prevalent and real now than it was just a hundred years ago. A hundred years ago, you could have some crisis in in Malaysia, and it wouldn't really affect much of what's going on. But if you look at the world now, with what's going on just next door to you guys, I mean, it's just the consequences are, some you can predict, some you cannot. It's, it's uh, so you have to be prepared for, you have to be prepared for things that will constantly surprise you. Someone said the surprising is not longer surprising. Uh, there are so many higher order connections that result in something that no one could have anticipated that, but the ideas have to live in that space. This is space of everything being interconnected. Yeah, so I, also, it's, I also think the, um... You know, the, the kind of order of magnitude difference is connectivity. You know, you could have 10 billion typewriters. Um, it's not anywhere near uh, one network. Like once you have connectivity, it's, it is a, uh, a phase change. It's a, different, it's a different beast. And so the kind of uh, change from a kind of mechanical world to a digital connected world uh, is you know a, a level of complexity that uh, that really is a new world yeah thank you yeah, that, that okay maximilian thank you all very much i think julian atinio has to close the session in four minutes yeah so uh, glad to see you all of you I hope you found some of the ideas uh, thought provoking. Uh, but as I said, the whole point of the book is at the end, we are giving talks to lots of different groups. Uh, Wednesday, we are giving a talk to 10,000 consultants from IBM. <laughs> <laughs> they are going to ask very different questions than you. <laughs> But the, the impact is on leadership and innovation. That, that's impact. But the idea is augmentation of thinking spaces. And the idea that 
it's probably good to kind of try to acquire a second pair of glasses or expand the ones that we all have. And right. the whole point is to understand how other people think, understand, yeah. Or in their case, acquire the company that makes the other glasses. <laughs> yes. Okay, so thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. I, have I have to announce the next two weeks uh, before I close it. Yeah. So next week we have Queen Dombrowski, uh, who is librarian at Stanford. She will talk about coding childcare better behaved tools, adventures in multilingual data setting. But since she has said yes, she's doing a thing called SUHO, which is the initiative, the global initiative to save the digital cultural heritage of Ukraine as we go. And they basically now are uh, firehousing out whatever they can. And so this is a very, very, very important initiative. And the week after, we'll have Frank Schweitzer talking about systems design. He's the chair of systems design at ETH, another Nexus person. And then we will return in fall. So with that, I would like to thank very much Julio Tino and Bruce Mao. This was a very, very great pleasure. Thank okay. you. Fantastic. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.